Welcome to the next one of our sound bites looking at the book of Revelation. We're coming closer to the climax as we look today at chapter 18 and the beginning part of chapter 19. But without further ado, let me read to you beginning at the beginning of chapter 18 of Revelation. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice he shouted, Fallen! Fallen is Babylon the Great! She has become a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird, for all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth have committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. And then I heard another voice from heaven say come out from her my people so that you will not share in her sins so that you will not receive any of her plagues for her sins are piled up to heaven and God has remembered her crimes give back to her as she has given pay back double for what she has done mix her a double portion from her own cup give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself in her heart she boasts, I sit as queen, I'm not a widow and I will never mourn. Therefore in one day her plagues will overtake her, death and mourning and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared in her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn for her. Terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, Woe, woe, O great city, O Babylon, city of power, in one hour your doom has come. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood and articles, every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron and marble, cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, myrrh and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages and bodies and souls of men. They will say, the fruit you long for is gone from you. All your riches and splendour have vanished, never to be recovered. The merchants will, who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off, terrified at her torment. They will weep and mourn and cry out, Woe, oh, 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 great city dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold and precious stones and pearls. In one hour such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea, will stand far off, and when they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, Was there ever a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads and with weeping and mourning cry out, Woe, woe, O great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour she has been brought to ruin. Rejoice over her, O heaven. Rejoice, saints and apostles and prophets. God has judged her for the way she treated you. Then a mighty angel, picking up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea and said, with such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. The music of harpists and musicians, flute players and tambourines and trumpeters will never be heard in you again. No workman of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of the millstone will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of the bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. Your merchants were the world's greatest men. By your magic spell all the nations were led astray. In her was found the blood of prophets and of the saints, and all of all who had been killed on the earth. And after this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who committed the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of, her, of his servants. 
And again they shouted, Alleluia! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne. And they cried, Amen! Hallelujah! And then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God! All you his servants, you who fear him, both small and great. Finally I heard something like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah! For the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. And then the angel said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. And at this I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, Do not do it. I am a fellow servant with you. And with your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now we left chapter 17 with God's assessment of the real nature of the so-called whore of Babylon. The world order that married satanic influence, human political power and secular ideology in a concerted effort to undermine God's given norms for the world. Making wealth a marker of significance, immorality as acceptable lifestyle choice and intolerance of any committed Christianity. Society is not neutral, it's a battlefield for influencing people's hearts and minds, either towards repentance and faith but more often against Christian values and norms and behaviour. But now in chapter 18, in verse 2 and 3 there, the fall of this Babylon is proclaimed by God. And in case we're tempted to compromising with the world, John is given to understand God's appointed end for this anti-Christian world ideology. This comes to us as a bit of a warning, because living in this world, we need to have regard to ourselves that we haven't become infected by it. And this becomes a lament, because... Much though the end of godlessness is to be desired, we get caught up in it too. So the challenge for us is, will we repent of the influence of godlessness that we find in us? Verse 2, fallen. Fallen is Babylon the great. She's become a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries and grown rich from her excessive luxuries. Godless society is coming to an end. Although its ruin will show it to be a, a home for demons and a haunt for unclean spirits, before the laments of people at its destruction, there's a command. Verse 4. To us, come out from her, my people, so that you will not share in her sin, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. You see, the assumption is that Christians must stand out against the godlessness of this society, or they will fall under its judgment too. For evil to triumph, it takes only for the good to be complacent. So the judgment that follows is simply an application of that great principle of judgment, you reap what you sow, or as verse 6 puts it, give back to her as she has given. God's call for us to repent is spelt out as John sees in his vision the woe of the people who lament Babylon's sudden and utter fall. They mourn what they miss of the godlessness that they previously enjoyed. And that helps us see what maybe has infected us, calling us to repent of those things. So what should we look for? Firstly, verses 9 and 10, we need to repent of the luxury of power. This is the warning to those of us with influence, not to allow wealth or power to be used for personal gain, but rather for justice and truth. We're in a strange age where self-confessed immoral people, serial liars and adulterers, are given power in our culture. And nobody seems bothered as long as they get us what we want. 
Well, the idea that it doesn't matter, it's a lie of Satan. The ends do not justify the means. If we elect the immoral, immorality flows. So repent of the luxury that power gives and repent of your reliance on market forces. Verses 11 to 17. This is a warning to those who rely on their material security and market forces to protect them. Society that's built on material things more than people or where people become pawns in some financial game, trading souls like other commodities, treating humans as simply resources. Verse 13. That society is doomed to fall. And we're to repent of the reliance on exploiting our creation Verses 17 to 19. Those who profit by exploiting natural resources instead of being good stewards as God commanded in creation. That is also going to fall. We can't sustain it forever. So what God proclaims is the sudden, utter collapse of a society built on power, trade and exploiting natural resources. <laughs> they got a taste of that literally only a few hundred years after this was written in the utter collapse of the Roman Empire that had promised to be there forever and fell almost overnight. But it's a warning to us, given that even some secular econ economists have predicted a dramatic collapse in world economies, given that technology now makes that a worldwide possibility, as Christians we need to ensure that we understand society not to be wealth and market driven, but God-centred and people-focused. We're to be giving a different voice into a culture that has bought into this world ideology. The call for our repentance here is to challenge in us those things that don't depend upon God and don't value human beings. What's clear from John's vision is that the fall of Babylon, the final archetypal godless society, will come suddenly and unexpectedly, as final as a tidal wave envisioned there in 1821-24, to wiping out everything. Nothing will remain of those who built their lives on power, the market and exploitation of creation. And how are we expected to respond to this vision? Simply by singing and shouting, Hallelujah! We're to rejoice at the defeat of a godless, driven society. How are we supposed to respond to God's promise to overthrow it? It, it might sound terrible to see society, secular society disintegrate, yet John envisages that by faith, far from being a disaster to God's people, the death of secular society should be a source of our joy. That's what the multitude in heaven will be singing about. Verse 19, chapter 1. Sorry, chapter 19, verse 1. Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the world, the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Judgment is to be for us a joy, not a disaster. We will finally see that the justice of God is what we were missing all along. And all the angels and the elders agree, verse 4, God himself commands it as a decree. Verse 5. Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. But how can that be when all that we have taken for granted about society is being overthrown? Well, the answer to that lies in the final celebration. Verse 6. Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him the glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, is given to her to wear. See, the overthrow of godless society will be a joy if we're ready to follow the God-given society under Jesus. If we're ready for the fulfilment of this promise, which will only happen if our love for God exceeds our love for the world. In short, it depends on what we are making our greatest investment in. We're investing in the rewards that this world offers, the influence of our wealth, the looseness of our morality, the luxury of power, the security of our materialism, our ability to exploit the environment. Or rather, are we investing our energies in the real world, where the knowledge of God, in the unprejudiced love of his people, in seeking peace, truth and faith, will give us a legacy that is lasting forever. See, on that day, our true desires, 
the desires of our hearts will be revealed because we'll be at a wedding. We will be either with our true love forever or shut out from his presence. If he is our true love, it should be the joy of seeing and finding in him all that we've been longing for. We will be there in a pure wedding dress, verse 8, which is the righteous acts of the saints. That is, those actions that have been moved by the love of Jesus, the times we've walked in the ways of Jesus. And we will, by grace, have an invitation to enjoy that forever, verse 9. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. That joy was so wonderful when John sees it that verse 10 he almost worshipped the angelic messenger. It's a warning maybe not to let the depth of our emotional experiences of faith take us from the focus of our faith. But John is reminded that these promises have already been given to those who are are holding to the testimony of Jesus, the gospel. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You see the gospel of Jesus is the sure promise of what the future holds. And we will find ourselves, find our significance and purpose in life, find the destination for our life when we worship him. The future is going to be worth it, as we'll see next time. The eternity that's promised will be glorious. But for now, the love in which we live, we are to feed and build and grow, looking for the day of the wedding feast of the Lamb, when we will see the one we love face to face and live with him for eternity. Well, more of this great vision next time. Let the words of this hymn encourage you and inspire you as you walk in that path. Thanks for listening. When peace like a Bye.
my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul, with my soul. It is well, it is well. It is well, it is well. 